everybody here uses internal tools? No, wait. Everybody here probably abuses internal tools, uses the wrong tool for the job, or uses a shit tool like email for every job. <laughs> I work in the internal tools team at GitHub. Um, I love building internal tools. I love having a, a very specific set of problems to solve for a limited scope of users. And I love that those users are my colleagues. The best software is designed around pain, real pain that your users feel right now. We're not trying to solve problems for every user, and we're not trying to solve problems for, um, for things that might come up in the, in the future. We're um, very much focusing on real pain that's felt now. And my role as a software developer in general, and certainly in internal tools, is to listen to those problems and figure out the best ways to take that pain away. At GitHub, we have a lot of internal tools, um, even things like, uh, like this, the groceries app, to ease the pain our office manager feels trying to manage the groceries for the office of who wants what and when. Tools for social problems albeit first world social problems, like I'm going to Australia, I wonder if there's anyone else going to be out that side of the world. Tools for silly personal problems, like damn it, I forgot my office key. We have a tool to open the door in that situation. And there's a lot of these tools that are fascinating in, the, in their own right, but in this talk, what I'd like to focus on is the bigger picture and how um, those tools and how we use them can actually create and nurture the culture we want in the workplace. So I'm going to look at three main areas, the work itself, interpersonal issues, and overall company strategy, and um, how the tools can affect all those. So the first big pain point, I, I just don't know who is working on what, which is a common pain felt in companies when the group of developers um, reaches over a certain point. And if we think what we want, what we want is, is greater visibility into who's working on what and the ability to share knowledge through that, through that visibility. So the how the, how the tools can help, we have this tool, an internal tool called Team, where, for example, everyone can post a status update on what they're working on, something they're researching maybe, something they find that they think would be of interest to the rest of the group, um, anything at all. Every member of staff can share, um, can share a status update. You might be working on several things, but there's also a section in the app to just say what you're focusing on right now, what the thing is you're next going to ship. And so we can browse a list of who is focusing on what. And these kind of tools are useful, not just out of curiosity or you know, nosiness, but actually aids productivity and efficiency in the workplace, because I can get an idea if there's something I'm going to start. Um, I can get an idea on who else has worked on similar things, who's focusing on something similar right now. And so we actually avoid you know, duplicating work and also increase the efficiency of how we're working um, through just um, sharing that information on, on who's working on what. And apart from those kind of practical benefits, just in terms of morale and motivation, um, it, it has a real boost uh, uh, for those things within the company because you, you want, of course it's voluntary, nobody's going to ask you to, um, to publish in a, you know, what you're working on or what you're going to ship next, but people do because you want to share that information and it's very motivating to see what other people are working on and you want to be able to um, have something to show for yourself. I guess a common problem with who, knowing who is working on what and that kind of visibility in some companies is 
just how much you get to mingle with other, um, with other teams, say. If you're a developer, you might not have that much close contact with um, whole groups of designers. Um, I might not know, say for example, I don't know what the ops guys do because they sit over there. And in a distributed company like GitHub, well, where is there anyway? So I know a lot of us use, um, use uh, chat rooms like Campfire uh, for this. So in a big company, there might be a lot of different rooms for different, different subjects. But, but what I find fascinating about really using the chat room as a tool internally is that you can create a curated list of what you're interested in. So there's nothing to stop me just hanging out in the ops room and seeing what kind of issues come up for those guys and how they deal with it. Um, and I'm, I'm perfectly welcome to do that. And you know, I can hang out in the design room, see what kind of um, problems the designers are having, what kind of research they're doing. I can join in in their conversation if I want to. And I can change that curated list of what I'm interested in day by day or throughout the day. Although as I took this screenshot and I was thinking, yeah, it is really nice that we have this open atmosphere that I can just hang out in the design room if I want to. I noticed that the title of the design room was Designers Only Fools Keep It Tight. But I know they love me, really. Um, so there's also a lot of technical information flows through the chat room. Every build, every, um, every commit, every build, um, every deployment, the output of all those commands is displayed automatically in the chat room. So there's a lot of visibility into who is working on, on what um, automatically f through those. Uh, Jesse Newland gave a talk on this about how the, the ops guys in particular use the chat room for, for greater visibility and for teaching by doing all the time. So I'd highly recommend, um, his slides are up on speaker deck, highly recommend having a look at that. So yeah, I guess through those tools, both tools that we've created specifically to solve our specific problems, but also just readily available tools like the chat room, um, but how we use those tools, that, um, that's really eased the pain of, um, of visibility into knowing who is working on what. A second common pain is just I feel disconnected because I'm remote. Out of curiosity, how many people here work remotely? Wow, that's like half the room or something. Uh, I work remotely, I have done for four or five years. Um, so this is, this, you know, I've definitely felt this across um, several companies, even with the, the best of intention. So if you think what we want in terms of, um, you know, having a distributed team, I was taught once to look at the, these kind of issues with status or power or that, that there's, in some of these situations, there's people who could be considered 60 feet tall and there's people that could be considered two foot tall. And I guess as a remote worker, we don't want to feel like we're two foot tall. We don't want to feel like second class citizens. Uh, GitHub has staff distributed all across the world. So this is a very real issue for us and something that we have to um, pay attention to and, and really think about how the tools we make and how the tools we, um, how we use the tools we have um, to really embrace this kind of distributed team. So I think the tools um, we use for that can, um, is kind of how that can help is split into two areas. There's the tools we specifically choose, some tools that we, we've developed from scratch. Like Play is a music application that controls the music that's played in the office in the headquarters in San Francisco. But every member of staff also has this as a Mac app and on our iPhones, iPads. So every member of staff, no matter their physical location, can listen to the same stream of music at the same time. And that alone is pretty cool and has a really unifying effect um, within the company. But better than that, every member of staff, no matter their physical location, can control what music is being played for every member um, of staff, no matter whether they're in the headquarters or 
you know, in Australia. So say, for example, somebody sitting in a hotel room in Denver <laughs> can control what music every single member of staff in my company is listening to at that moment in time. I can even turn up the volume. I can turn up the volume to the music played at my company's headquarters in San Francisco probably quicker than the person sitting beside the, you know, the sound system in the office. And through the apps and also through the chat room, I can just say that I like a song that's playing. And I can do that privately in the app and just collate my own list of my favorite songs. Or I can do it publicly in the chat room with this command. And that then um, you know, really unifies us through the music and lets people know uh, uh, who's got shared interests and you know, in increases kind of empathy within the team. And obviously, a team that empathizes with each other is probably going to work better together. And those apps I showed you with like the status updates and the shipping, they're not just web applications, but we have those on our iPads, iPhones. So really embracing that work can be done from any location at any, in any time zone. Um, and these tools were built specifically to um, help with that disconnect of, of, of a distributed team. Maddox set out specifically with the music application, knowing that the music would be a helpful tool to unify, um, to unify everybody in the company. Um, so those aren't accidental benefits of these tools. They were, um, it, was, it was set out to, to, to be that way. And the other side of, of how the tools can help is just the tools that we don't abuse. So things like in-person meetings, phone calls, things that require you to be in the same physical location and probably on the same time zone, those things still take place, of course, but we're really conscious just not to abuse them as, um, as methods of communication. Communication is mostly asynchronous and very much out in the open for everybody to see. Sometimes that's really good, and having unexpected peer support in the middle of your day um, is, is a wonderful treat. Sometimes it's really bad. Um, I woke up to this kind of commentary one morning that, um, on work that was in progress. And yeah, that, that wasn't pleasant to, to read first thing in the morning. Um, and we have to be conscious that with digital communication, even neutral language um, used in digital communication, the, the bias is for that to be perceived as negative. So if negative language is used in digital communication, the, the negative effect of that is amplified. So it's just something, I guess this, this form of communication can just expose the sharp edges of, of that. And we just have to be conscious of it. Um, and maybe just keep in mind if the language you're using is positive and if it empowers the person you're speaking to, you know, not accusing them. But for good or bad, at least all the communication is out in the open. It's unlikely that people are criticizing your work um, behind your back at a water cooler somewhere. It's all there to see um, in the chat room. But the difficulty with um, that kind of open communication is that sometimes, you know, I, I know I felt it, I know I'm not alone in feeling it. Sometimes there's just a desire to go away and hide and maybe produce your work until you think it's kind of shiny and perfect and then share it with the group. That's just not the culture that, we've, um, that we have at GitHub, GitHub. It's much more about sharing early and sharing often with your work. So one example where I've had great difficulty with this is when I first started. The application that I um, work on was originally built as a Sinatra app. Um, when I took it over, I felt basically that it had got big enough and ugly enough that I thought it would be um, beneficial going forward for the development to basically rewrite it in a Rails app. When I suggested this in the chat room 
um, the response was enthusiastically negative. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of discussion in the chat room that this you know, was unnecessary or, or just a plain bad idea. But, but I felt very strongly that you know, I was meant to have some ownership of this app and I felt very strongly that this was um, gonna be beneficial um, moving forward. So my colleague who really opposed the idea but was supportive enough to say, well, go do some work, but put it in a pull request and we'll have the discussion about whether it should happen there. So I was very nervous about putting this pull request out there. Um, you know, I was a new girl, I'd only been there a couple of weeks, I probably shouldn't be rocking the boat, and here I was capsizing the boat. <laughs> so this is the start of the pull request. Um, I fully expected this, the pull request to be slammed down, um, given the chat that had preceded it in, the, in Campfire, but actually, the unexpected benefit of putting it out there was that people who hadn't been involved in the initial discussions in the chat um, noticed, the, noticed the pull request um, and got involved in the discussion. And the, the discussion got very heated. <laughs> I think it's possibly still the pull request with the most um, comments uh, in, in the application, but um, a, and a lot of the arguments then, even though it was sort of my argument to have, a lot of the argument took place um, you know, asynchronously, so on whatever time zone it suited the different people involved in the discussion. So one morning I woke up and there had been eight hours of, of like, um, quite heavy argument about whether this should be done or not, but in the end it resolved that um, yeah, this was a good way going forward and I was able to, to complete the work and get it merged into master. Um, and get, I guess basically the lesson I learned from this is if you can get over that initial hurdle of discomfort of um, putting your work out there early and often, that actually the, the unexpected benefit of sharing that information and letting anybody in the company um, contribute to this discussion, um, well, actually you know, had a big win for me. Um, also, I've really learned from, from our approach to pull requests is that pull requests shouldn't be used necessarily as something just for when the work is finished and you think it's ready to get merged into master. We very much use them early and often because we feel that is actually the correct location to have a, have a discussion on, on the code that it's sitting right, you know, right beside. So, um, yeah. And, I guess on that note, Brian, uh, Brian Dahl's written about um, you know, our, our approach to pull requests, but Brian Dahl told me recently that he even puts out pull requests for, for code that he doesn't even want merged in. He just wants to use it as a tool to spark an argument. <laughs> so the communication is mostly asynchronous, um, but we do achieve cooperation through highly visible communication, um, yeah, through, I guess through just basically through highly communication, we really ease the pain of that disconnect. And in terms of overall company strategy, how do you give feedback on things you do like, things you don't like, things you think you just, could be, could be done better. If the only time you're asked what you don't like about the company you're working in or what you think could be done better is at your exit interview, you're totally doing it wrong. Think about what, what we do want. I guess at GitHub we have quite a radical approach where we think any, every member of staff should be able to affect change in the company. But even at a most basic level for any organization, it's beneficial for every member of staff to be able to offer feedback at any time. Within our internal um, team app, we have a section on ideas where everybody can publish ideas on things they like or don't like or things they think could be done better. Notice it's not called shit I don't like. It's called ideas. 
So the onus really is on you to propose solutions. So by all means, people, can, um, people do publish ideas on something that they don't like, but it's the onus is on them to turn it around and say, well, I don't like this thing, but I propose, you know, here's some solutions I, I propose. What do you guys think? And this is a really um, active area of discussion in the company. This year so far, there's been an average of 35 ideas published a month. And around 12 comments per idea. So it's a really dramatically uh, noticeable heavy area of discussion in the company. And so basically this tool of ideas facilitates anyone in the company to express basically anything they think is important to the rest of the company and to express it at any time. So nobody has to wait, uh, well, A, nobody has to send an email, say, to arrange a meeting to discuss this thing that they think is important. Nobody has to ask a manager to raise this issue that they think is important further up the chain. Absolutely anybody can just publish the idea at any time that suits them. And quite often, you know, Sunday afternoons, there's a, there's a spree of um, new ideas get posted. So I guess what I hope you get from this talk is an insight into some of the tools that we use, but also just a, an appreciation that the tools are, are, are bigger than that, that really through what tools we choose to use and how we choose to use them, that we can create and nurture the, the culture and the atmosphere that we want at work. So I'd encourage you to think about the tools you're using already or have access to. Um, you don't need to create brand new software uh, for your internal tools at work. You can just be thinking about what tools you already have access to. Definitely things like pull requests, um, obviously chat rooms. And think about what tools you're abusing. If you use email as a default method of communication for everything, then that's a communication smell. It's also kind of rude, you know, if you've got a big like um, email thread, there's not really a polite way to opt out of that. Whereas with, with it, the discussion happening in the pull request, you can easily change and control how you're notified or not. And I guess think about the pain points that are specific to your group of people or your company. Um, there's nothing to say that how we do things is the correct way for anybody else. It's just that we've really considered what our pain points are and what the best solutions are to, to ease those. So think about what the pain points are that are specific to you. Think about what the best way is to ease those pains. And I'd highly recommend working on internal tools. It's awesome. Tamer? <laughs> uh, so one of the challenges that I face whenever we start adding um, internal tools that, that are uh, posting information to our campfire room or sending out emails or notifications of some sort, and I've hit this with every company I've been in, is how do you manage information over, overload? How do, you, how do you help your employees or yourself just see the stuff that you actually care about? when you don't necessarily know what that stuff is ahead of time. Um, so the question, I guess, is how do you manage the, the information overload coming through on that? And about ahead of time, how do you mean, sorry? Well, I mean, clearly with email, you can just set up a whole bunch of filters, but that's a lot of work, and that assumes that you have some keyword you can filter on, such as Tamar gives a shit. Yeah. And my, my friends don't tag emails correctly, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess my experience, like I've definitely felt that information overload, particularly in, in the chat rooms. So I, like, you know, I have, uh, say there's like general chit chat chat rooms that people float in and out, but then there's more specific work areas. It's I presume similar setup in most companies. Um, 
and I tend to hang out mostly in the one that's for internal tools, but you know, browse into others. Uh, sometimes I find that even the information in the one that should be my focus to be an overload. Um, my own way of dealing with that is sometimes to just accept that I can't absorb all the information coming in, and sometimes I'll just ignore it and just, just work. Other people I've noticed can really um, well manage keeping up to date with it seems nearly all the chat and somehow produce lots of work. Um, I've decided to try and treat the chat, the information coming through almost like Twitter and that it doesn't really matter if I read everything, that if there's something that's important, it'll rise to the top again or if it's something that really needs my attention, somebody will ping me specifically about it. And I find that is what tends to happen. If you're known for, oh, Kiwi's dealing with such and such thing, then people just tend to ping me if there's something that needs my attention. Um, if there's just general stuff going on in the rest of the company and that kind of information overload, yeah, I just treat it like Twitter and that I'll, it'll somehow surface to me if it was important enough to get my attention. But I don't, I'd be happy to hear if there's better ways of dealing with that kind of information overload. Randall? <laughs> so what do you do when you end up life a tool? And like, like, how do you deal with end up life a tool like if three people are only using it or four people are only using it? Because, I mean, we found sometimes like you get a tool and it's, it's key for a while, but then you want to get rid of it or replace it with something better and you're like, they're always going or if you don't, then you've got 30 tools that yeah, are all kind of doing the same thing. So the question is, how do you end the life of a tool that isn't being used much, or? Yeah, or how do you keep the tools? I keep from using multiple tools for the same, same tasks. Yeah. Uh, I haven't experienced that. People using the same tool for, or sorry, different tools for the same task. Well, so let's say email, Basecamp, um, right. pull requests, Trello, Trello Pivotal Tracker, if right. people are choosing what tools they want to use on their own, you have to assume you're not dictating. Yeah. Um, my, ex my experience, I'm, I, I've only been at GitHub since the summer, so this is kind of recent, um, but I'm, I am fascinated by how we use the internal tools. So say, for example, email. I've worked at companies where everything is through email, and it's like you, you, know, you have to have umpteen filters, and it's really difficult to manage that flow. What I've found at GitHub is that if people, because there are no specific rules, right? You can use whatever communication tool you want to. What I've found is that if someone uses email as a blanket, you know, telling people about something that could have just been used and could have just been mentioned in Campfire, actually people tend to push back on that and say, whoa, stop, you know, invading my inbox. Um, so it's, my experience of that is that it's just been a kind of collective culture of people saying, I don't want this through email. Um, I'd prefer it over there where I can ignore it if I want to. Or, But on a, on a, I guess on a more positive side of that is I've also seen, um, I was in the office a couple of weeks ago and I was standing in person beside a designer and she was giving me some tips on something online she wanted to show me. And she said, oh, I'll send you the, or I said, you know, can you send me the URL for that? And I would have expected that to just come in an email, say, or you know, we had IM open beside us, but she said, oh, yeah, I'll send you the, email, the URL, and she posted it in the design chat room. And afterwards, I was thinking, well, of course, that's much better, because although it was something that was intended for me, actually, of course, a handful of other people went, oh, that's interesting, and you know, the knowledge is shared. So you talked about pain points and understanding what they are and, uh, and what you can do about them. Um, users are notoriously bad at, at expressing their own pain points and you, there has to be like a conversation around it where you can help them drill down to it. How do you guys address that? Do you mostly say, you know, you're devs and you know what you're talking about or do you have to help them understand, well, you know, really the problem is that whatever. Yeah. So the question is, I guess, how do you um, guide the discussion on the pain points to really get to the correct pain that needs solved. Um, I guess the beauty of working in internal tools is that you, you have a really specific user base. So people are quite obviously well informed already about the software and, you know, and that development process and are already in tune with the idea of 
um, say, shipping small features and that kind of thing. So, but I guess that does come up sometimes. Um, well, it came up recently where we collect information for a business card, say, and the person who does that, who organizes, you know, what information, he said, oh, it'd be great if, if team could collect that information for us. And initially I thought, yeah, well, that would be easy to add in. But um, Maddox, actually, my colleague said, uh, no, you know, we're not, that's inappropriate. It's not the right place. He said, well, yes, I, I understand you have a pain, but we're not gonna solve it through this software. Um, solve it through this other, and suggested how, the, what the better way to solve that was, so. Um, but people generally in, in that audience base are very vocal about telling you what their pains are. But yeah, I guess there's still an element of, well, um, as the developers working on that product, we have ownership of it. Um, and, you know, we, we can guide that to a certain extent or curate what, um, what should be done? Yeah. Hi. Hey, what's your primary method of knowing what tools to build into? Is it the ideas out there? Um, so the question, what's, how do we decide what tools to build internally? Um, yeah, th through the ideas um, that I showed you that people publish, um, sometimes they do uh, You focus on an existing tool or, or something that um, should be modified or the, the discussing what there's a need for. So that's usually the main area. And then, yeah, I guess starting off through ideas. So somebody has to have a quite a coherent argument. Um, and then, yeah, I guess, I think a phrase I've heard mentioned in our work is it's the land of the coherent argument or the reasoned argument. So it's very much something that's just, uh, the ideas are bashed around and if it's, if it seems like there's enough interest or need for it th through the discussion in an idea, then it's up to somebody who wants it enough to start a pull request is, is the next level. So ideas and then pull request, even if the pull request is a sketch that says, I kind of want something like this, or um, literally just a, a development of that idea and points that should be done, then um, I, I, I'm really in support of this idea that pull requests are the appropriate place for a discussion on not could something happen. You know, ideally you've already um, proved that it could happen, whether you know, through discussion or some initial code, but the pull request is the appropriate place to say, should this happen? And very often pull requests are closed with a no, it shouldn't. Oh, good question. Um, so what's our distribution method for the apps? I don't know, Maddox makes all that work. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. We, we, have, we have like a website where you, you can download all the various apps and I don't actually know technically how that's set up. Do you know, Tim? No. Hi. How many hours a day do you guys work? I mean, I, I, by, that question implies you guys are in campfire, email, commenting on everything. Hmm. It, it, I mean, it sounds like you guys are working like 12 hour days and you're spending, you know, somebody's talking around the world for eight hours on a pull request when you wake up. You've got to go back and read all that, understand what all the different arguments are. I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of stress, other things going on. Yeah. Well, I guess that ties into Tamar's question on just the information overload that, um, you know, I'll only keep track of what pull requests I'm involved in or, at, you know, as a priority, and then I can, brow I can choose to browse out of things I'm interested in. So I, 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 I can see the stream of what, what is going on, but I can do that on my phone, you know, as I'm walking to the store. So I can just glance at things and get a sort of summary of if there's anything that's taken my interest, and then I know what, what to follow up on. So it just seems to be, um, it's a, Obviously, there's a lot of personal preference comes into it, and you can just pick and choose. It's not, it's never going to be compulsory to keep up, and it would be impossible, like you say, to keep up with, with every discussion because then you wouldn't, you know, get much work done. Tell me. It's kind of a follow-up question. First of all, I love the image of you um, at the grocery store getting really pissed off at some of the comments on the pull request. <laughs> but how do you how do you handle 
because of the highly distributed nature, and let's just take that one pull request as an example, mm -hmm. that's a lot of work that was in that pull request and is ongoing work, but there's a big discussion back and forth about whether or not it should continue. Yeah. So you're in the middle of doing that code, you submit it, and you have to wait for them to wake up to have their side of the discussion, and then it feels like the ping pong back and forth would yeah. take a lot of time. Do you just have many things that you're working on independently and so you go focus on something else? Interesting, because during that exact example, there was a lot of work. I mean, I basically rewrote the main application that we use internally, and I was aware that that was an unpopular move, <laughs> uh, and, you know, for, or it was a contentious move. Um, there was a lot of work involved in it, but I wanted to just get it done. So actually, it didn't occur to me to stop working and wait for their decision. <laughs> I, I just, um, I was always aware that there was this discussion going on, and I was aware, you know, it, it was an awkward discussion just because I was new, and it was kind of coming up with this, coming up to speed with the learning curve of how, um, passionately things are discussed in a, in a pull request or in general there. So it was, there was a lot of per, you know, difficulties just getting up to speed with that, but um, I wanted the work done, so I just got on with it and kind of hoped for the best that they would, they would come around. And um, yeah, it worked out. I guess in other ones, that are maybe simpler, you, you know, you might be kind of dipping in and out of three different sort of features, say. So there would be cases where you would just leave that to the side. If it, say, if it needed input from other people, you know, then that's just gonna sit and carry on with something else, and you know, that's pretty common too. Jeremy? Um, so you have, the, you have the list of ideas that were completed and committed. Yeah. What's the rate of the kill? ideas that were come up with and people said, you know what, uh, no. Or pull requests that people push out and say, okay, I've, well, I've got an idea here, here's a sample of it, no, let's get the discussion. Yeah. And people say, no, we're not gonna do that. So, what is there a ratio of the thought of um, I, I don't know what the ratio of ideas that get kills it, killed is or stats on that. I will, I should find out actually, because that'd be interesting. Um, one of the things I added to that was just to, uh, like, you know, the facility to kill an idea or say that, no, this got, sh this got shipped, and then to, to view the ones that got killed or, or actually got shipped. Um, but I don't know in terms of numbers. Some of the ideas are concrete things that can either be built or not, and some of them are more general, just issues, say, about, about training or our approach to, um, or even there's, there's been a long-running one about um, women in the industry, say, or, um, I mean, there was one about wanting to start a book club. There's others that are very technical, maybe about specific security concerns that are going on. So some of them have a, a definite outcome, I guess, and some of them are just general um, discussion and, and awareness, yeah. So the question, if, uh, if we're starting a new tool, do we have like a template or is there a specific, um, you know, uh, Rails template, say, a Rails app that we build on or is it all an expansion of the one main app? Um, so I guess the first part of that is we don't build new tools very often, um, really. Um, we're kind of very selective about pinpointing what needs um, a technical solution, I guess. and. The, the, the handful of tools are very, you know, they're, they're, they're very well used already, so I, I'm, there's nothing that springs to mind anyway of like a, a new thing that's hap happening recently. Um, but then in terms of a template or a, or a regular structure even or approach, it's, it's an, an, an individual basis. So some of the apps are Sinatra apps and some are Rails apps and um, 
some have, as I've learned painfully, different test suites to others and all sorts of variations actually within that. Um, so there's different, you know, and different people working on, um, on the different apps. So it tends to be what that group of people want to, want to, to start out. Um, although there's some cross-pollination and people, anyone really can, can contribute, you know, and does contribute to, for example, the, the main application that I work on, anybody in the company can, um, can jump in and contribute on that if there's something that they really want in. Do you guys segregate your nonsense? Yeah. I don't know about y'all, but our campfire has squirrels and cats and <laughs> pugs and shit. And if you have a bad day and you just want to get your work done, you got to scroll through a bunch of pugs to get some possible <laughs> 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 Pugs aren't critical, but, you know, I, I wonder how you handle the asynchronicity and the catching up. You know, is there an expectation that you catch up on three days worth of pug bombs versus <laughs> something that's critical in there? So, like, I, I've been thinking about segregating our, our rooms out and just wondering what you guys do and what your expectations are for keeping up with. Yeah, well, it, the, the nonsense is definitely segregated. Um, and not to say nonsense doesn't filter into other things, but it's pretty much segregated into, into one um, general chit chat kind of room. Um, the other rooms stay fairly on topic. Um, and I. I know some people, you know, when things are starred or highlighted, some people just catch up on a kind of highlighted um, summary of the day that way. That's always interesting. It's usually things from the nonsense room. Um, but yeah, there's no real expectation and some, some people are, are more interested in keeping up to speed with the chat or not, but definitely when you need to be involved, you just get dragged in. You know, and we've sat and joked around like idiots on a Friday evening, just calling people's name to see how long it takes them to jump in to Campfire. Because you know, we've got you know we've got chat applications on our phone that have been custom made for you know specific extra features that are useful to us. So um, you know, if people are at mention, it, it notifies them on their phone. Yeah, I've been out cycling on my bike and can hear my phone. I'm like, those guys are just winding me up. You know. But, um, yeah, I mean, and that's, a, that's an interesting part of chat as an internal tool of just that kind of um, general chit chat. It's, it's funny and it's useful at bonding the team. Yeah. I mean, my, I, there's a photo of me that was made into a meme in my first week of work in there where I'm, it's on my website, I think, where I'm holding a sign sort of screaming. And that got made into a meme by Scott Chacon on my first week that now in Campfire people can write, Kiwi me, whatever. And you know my photo appears holding that sign. So thanks, guys. Yeah, um, but that's all valid, and I think it's just you know a personal trying to manage how much you know how much of that you you know you can absorb. Or so the question is, do we ever open source any of our internal tools? Nope. <laughs> uh, not. Not yet. <laughs> Do you ever have people like express resentment like about being so connected all the time? I mean, really, like the higher bar with the develop like the entire team I feel like has to raise this bar of you're always expected because you have the iPhone app. We, we, we know you have an iPhone, we know you have an iPad, we know you're on the web. It's like why did you respond? You know, do you ever have people like that? Like I feel like I'm I'm I my bar got raised to the point now it's like I'm giving it more and more time. Yeah. So the, I guess the question is, do people end up resenting the amount of on-demand kind of on-call communication? Um, yes. You know, I've, I'm pretty sure I've seen somebody say, but again, then, then they've said that, you know, oh, actually, this is just too much for me for, you know, this couple of days that I'm saturated, I'm going to switch off. Or I'm sure I've seen somebody say, oh, I just don't like these methods, so I opt out. And, you know... If that, if that works for them, you know, if, I guess it's something that needs to be negotiated in the team if it was a long running issue that somebody wanted, but certainly people can opt out temporarily. Can I just jump back to that question actually about open sourcing the software? I just realized I'm wrong in that there, we do have an internal tool just on for getting our development environment set up um, and running like with 
such minimal ease. It's fantastic. And uh, the, the Ops guys have just been working on it. It's, I think it's released already, Boxing. Um, they're working on open source and that. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's been really useful, like literally just write, like type in one command and having everything that you need for the development environment installed and kept up to date and, yeah. B-O-X-E-N, yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. But it is open source, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you.